I'm going to talk about two general uh, topic areas. First, I want to um, comment a little bit on the Oregon experience, where we've been, what the results have been in Oregon from our planning program. But I want to focus most of my time on the future, looking forward where are we headed, um, and, and really getting at the issue of adaptability of the Oregon program. I won't, I won't expressly uh, use transferability, but adaptability is an is a, a indicator of things that may be important uh, to other areas. So um, or, Ethan did a great job of talking about context, and uh, there are three fundamental outcomes that Oregon's planning program was designed to deliver. And uh, they are um, conservation of working farms, conservation of working forests, and the last one, control of, uh, of growth and avoidance of sprawl. And that, that last one, it's important to emphasize uh, something that, that Ethan alluded to but didn't expressly say. Oregon is between California and Washington, and a lot of the ethos in, in Oregon is defining itself as not California. Um, so many people, and, and Ethan said at the end, many people move to Oregon for quality of life. That whole avoidance of development patterns, growth patterns that we saw in California in the 1960s and 1970s was very much a part of the political uh, impetus for the formation of the Oregon program. So what, what have the actual results been? Well, um, there's been some recent research uh, using uh, aerial data looking at actual land use on the ground in the state of Washington, which has a growth management program not as strong as Oregon's, and Oregon as well. And essentially, Oregon has lost no uh, forest land and almost no agricultural land to conversion to either urban or rural residential uses in the last 15 years. Um, it's just stabilized completely the land use patterns on, on uh, the rural landscape. Um, in addition to that, looking at uh, density numbers between Oregon, Washington, Idaho, and California, uh, and this is from census data from 2000 and 2010 for cities over 20,000 in the, in the four states, density in Oregon is increased in those ur uh, urban areas by 8.3%, in Washington by 6.7%. In Idaho, the state of Idaho, which has no land use planning program, density is, in cities has actually decreased by 6.6%. And then California, uh, it's increased by 4.2%. So that's a little bit just in terms of where we've been with Oregon's program. Um, I, I want to uh, stress that Oregon's program is not a comprehensive uh, program. It really does focus on these uh, fundamental things that define the state at a state <coughs> scale, at a state level. It does not try to get in the pockets of cities and counties and really dictate exactly how they plan within their uh, particular area. And when we have, on occasion, tried to do that, typically we've gotten into trouble. Um, when we've tried through a transportation planning rule uh, or through protection of natural resource uh, decisions within particular communities. The reaction to that has been negative and the state has generally had to back off from uh, trying to be too prescriptive on those things. So um, in thinking of the other presentations yesterday, this, this notion that the scale that the state program tries to operate on, it, it, it picks a few things that really matter at that larger scale and focuses on those and doesn't really try to get into the details of uh, what local governments do in, in traditional land use planning. So let me talk a little bit about going forward. Um, the Oregon program is not static, even though you heard that uh, essentially the land use uh, patterns on the landscape are not changing. The nature of what's going on on those lands is changing all the time. We have a very rapidly growing wine industry and uh, Ethan and I are working right now on, on how to make that fit with the rest of the agricultural sector over time. There are lots of new challenges coming forward at the state level, at that state scale. One of them is climate change, and you're going to hear about California's program uh, later today. Oregon has a similar program, some parts of which were copied from California. One difference I'll note, though, is in Oregon, we sort of went that last step of not only requiring uh, the major urban areas to do scenario planning of what, how to reduce greenhouse gas emissions over time. 
but actually for our largest metro area, the Portland metro area, they are actually required to implement, they're required to choose and then implement a scenario that will reduce uh, 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 vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas uh, emissions for that area. Uh, so that's a, and then the other major metropolitan areas in the state to varying degrees, um, there's, there's another one that has a sort of a soft requirement and then the other uh, metro areas um, are just doing the scenario <coughs> planning very much like California is doing. So another challenge that uh, we have in Oregon uh, is conflicts between um, energy generation and natural resources. Uh, and I want to talk about the energy sector for a minute. Um, Oregon, again, in response to climate change, and like many other states in the United States, has something called a renewable portfolio standard. This is a requirement in the absence of a federal energy policy that uh, at a state level, a certain percentage of energy be produced through renewable resources. And uh, Oregon, California, Washington all have pretty uh, aggressive renewable portfolio standards. This means on the ground that we have to cite uh, wind facilities, uh, new transmission lines. We're also looking at wave uh, and, and wind energy off the Oregon coast. And in each of those instances, there are conflicts between the new energy generation that we're trying to cite. Uh, in one instance, uh, uh, the wind, the main uh, wind potential is in eastern Oregon. As Ethan pointed out, that's the dry part of the state. The main uh, industry, traditional industry in that part of the state is ranching. Uh, there's no conflict per se between ranching and wind, but um, there is a conflict with a natural resource out there. Sage grouse is an <coughs> indicator species. Many of you have probably heard of the northern spotted owl. Well, the sage grouse is the northern spotted owl of eastern Oregon. It and good. it tastes good too, yes. And actually, there, <laughs> yes, that's right. And believe it or not, there is still a hunting season on sage grouse. Um, so, so uh, wind facilities. And, and ranching both have impacts on sage grouse, making it very likely that the federal government will list that species under our federal environmental um, uh, endangered species act. And if that happens, uh, the ranching industry will be severely curtailed in Eastern Oregon. So we're currently working on a landscape <coughs> level planning ex exercise, a spatial plan in this case, um, identifying uh, resource areas for sage grouse, identifying areas of potential for wind development, identifying areas that are important to ranching, and trying to uh, essentially maximize the ability to site wind, um, do ranching and wind in a sustainable way that's compatible with this, this existing natural resource. Uh, another example, uh, similar example, but in the water is go also going on in Oregon right now. The states in the United States have jurisdiction over the first three miles of the ocean. And so we are um, currently <coughs> doing a spatial plan of the entire uh, Oregon coast to identify where uh, wave and wind facilities can be placed doing the least uh, conflict with traditional fishing industries. So again, another um, thing at a larger scale, not looking at a city or county scale, but doing doing something really at a state scale. So with that, I'll close and uh, we'll take some questions. Thank you. <laughs>